Welcome to the Black Girls Heal podcast, where we talk about changing unavailable relationship patterns, healing unresolved trauma, and building a healthy relationship with first you and then others. Every episode, we will talk about actionable advice that you can apply today to break unhealthy patterns and grow your self-worth. I'm Sheena Tubbs. Let's begin. Hello, ladies, and welcome to the latest episode of Black Girls Heal. I am sending you joy. I'm sending you love. I'm sending you prosperity and abundance on this lovely day. You can have all of the things that you deserve, that you want, that you really crave in your heart. And I pray that today you are either receiving them openly with open hands, or you are one step into stepping into that place in your life. And if not, that this podcast episode will help you get one step closer to that. So today we are going to be breaking down the uh, different types of love addiction. So here on this podcast, I talk all about love addiction as our gateway into healing. There are multiple ways that people access the importance of working on themselves. Some people have um, experienced depression. Some people experienced extreme anxiety. Some people experience a tragedy and these are different things that make people realize that there is something else deeper going on. There's something that I need support with. And this podcast and what I do in Black Girls Heal is I use relationships as our gateway. I believe that relationships are a great mirror of what is happening both within us and also how we show up in the external world. And I like to focus not just on relationships in general, but for that that special niche of us who our relationship problems seem like they're a little bit out of control, that our breakups hurt us much deeper. There's a lot more um, frantic ne- franticness, pain, depression around that that we tend to have a hard time putting up boundaries more than other people, that our codependence is more, um, feels more intrinsic and the regular tools and things that work for other people don't seem to work for us. And we feel a lot of shame about it. And no matter how much we try that, that that's who I talk to here. And one of the terms that I use is love addiction, which is the persistent obsession of a person a relationship or a fantasy and mistaking it for love and using that to self-medicate. Sometimes you're aware that you're doing that. Sometimes you are not, especially, especially if you're like the type of woman I talk about often on this podcast where we have everything together and it just slips through the cracks um, because you're high performing in every other area, just because you got some dating issues, just because you have some relationship issues, it's easy to discount that as just a normal part of life versus a symptom of a deeper um, trauma response, trauma issue for you to work on. All that to say with love addiction, love addiction is not one size fits all. Um, Love addiction can show up in many different forms. And so today I want to talk about the four different types of love addicts for you to be able to self-assess. Is this me? Is this a friend of mine? Am I a mixture of both? Am I a little bit of this? Did I used to be this one, but now more this one? Or am I none of the above? Okay. Before we get into that, we are going to have a free pop-up webinar for you ladies who are listening to this podcast live. It is going to be dedicated to those of us who want to make sure that 2021 is not ratchet when it comes to relationships, that we are a little bit more in control, that we're a little bit more clear, that we um, know what we need to do to break out of our patterns. And so the name of our free workshop is going to be seven ways to not be codependent in your relationships in 2021, how to go from feeling needy, stressed, or disappointed to feeling fulfilled. Y'all, I'm literally going to break down seven different things for us to keep our eyes out for and also what to do instead. So make sure you bring your pen and your paper to this free pop-up workshop. It's going to be on Monday, October 19th at seven o'clock PM CST. Only ladies who register will be able to get the replay. And for you to register, you can go to blackgirlstale.org slash webinar. Um, and again, it will be live. So make sure 
You don't dilly dally. Make sure you stop what you're doing. You pull over the car to the side of the road and you go ahead and you grab your seat because again, the replay will only be for ladies who register. Um, so let's jump into this episode, which is sponsored by our conference. I'm so excited y'all. Um, if this is your first time joining this podcast, um, you have not heard me gushing about our February event, which is titled The Healed and Loved Woman, which will bring together all of the concepts that I teach here in Black Girls Heal about going from being love addicted to more love balance, from going from being love av- love avoidant and not really knowing how to be vulnerable and be open and be connected to yourself to becoming more love available and working through all of the love unworthiness that goes underneath that um, to become your full self. We're going to be talking about all of those parts while also celebrating um, rejoicing in who we are, rejoicing in sisterhood um, and having a great time. So that will be in Houston, Texas, February 12th through the 14th. Um, and for you to learn about our conference, you can go to blackgirlsheal.org slash conference, um, limited spots only because of sister COVID, sister Rona. Um, and we want to make sure that we have all of our social distancing guidelines in place so that, um, everyone can feel as comfortable as they can while also nourishing, pampering and loving on themselves. So let's jump into these four different types of love addicts. So if you've watched our free masterclass, which is different than our pop-up workshop, our masterclass is available throughout the year um, where I talk about how I help women through this process. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. I talk to you about my Thrive Method, what that is and how I use that with my students. Um, And again, that's free. But at the very beginning of it, and I'm trying not to give y'all too many links, y'all. (laughs) <laughs> but in me wanting to like fully explain things, I'm like, oh, I probably need to tell them the link to that too. So the third link and hopefully the last link, um, and all this will be in the show notes. So, um, you can easily just click through to this instead of having to write it down. But if you want to watch that masterclass, which is free, you can go to blackgirlsheal.org slash masterclass. And you can also just go to our website. All these links are on the front page of the website for you to just easily click through, um, and get there. Um, anyways, at the beginning of the masterclass, I talk about the four different types. So this is going to be a recap for those of you who have watched that. So the four types are the hopeless romantic love addict, the codependent love addict, the serial monogamer love addict, and the fantasizer love addict. Once again, it's the hopeless romantic love addict, the serial monogamer love addict, the codependent love addict, and the fantasizer love addict. So uh, these are going to be really fun to dive into. And many of them may be self-explanatory, but let's break them apart. Okay, so let's start with our hopeless romantics. How many of y'all are hopeless romantics? Raise your hand. I know I'm not the only one. Um, Our hopeless romantics love the idea of love. We love the idea of being booed up, of just having that um, ultimate love, soulmate kind of thing. Um, Even if we are the ones who kind of hide out in the background and we are not overt with that, we love those types of stories um, and we hope to have those type of stories ourselves um, to be with our best friend, which of course, what is wrong with that? That is what we're searching for, right? Those of us who want to be in romantic partnerships, of course, um, some of us listening, this is not your current goal, but for those of us who that is something that we want to be a part of our life. Um, that is the goal, right? Of healthy love is having that immediate, um, not immediate, but having that attraction and connection and, um, sense of partnership. The thing about a hopeless romantic though, is that she will use, and men can be hopeless romantics too, but this podcast is for the girls. So, um, for the people who identify as female. And so, um, what we can do is we can self-medicate our inner wounds and traumas by over-focusing on how this romantic love 
is the ultimate cure, how it is the ultimate experience um, on how this partnership can, um, can fix something that's a little bit deeper. Sometimes we have words for it, sometimes we don't. Here are some specific symptoms for you to look out for. We are the type who in relationships, we fall in love very easily and too quickly. Um, and again, this is repetitive. Um, phrases that hopeless romantics will use is I love hard when I love, I love hard. And it's almost, it's interesting because it's said as a badge of honor, but usually in the relationships that someone talks about loving hard, they're talking about it at a time in a way where they have been, um, hurt by it. So, you know, when I'm in relationships, I love hard and I keep getting disappointed or I keep getting taken advantage of, or, you know, it's something like you're waiting for someone to reciprocate the intensity with which you give your commitment and your loyalty, right? And so commitment and loyalty is not bad. The problem is for those of us who say, well, I love, I love hard. And this is a repetitive pattern and you keep getting hurt is you keep choosing to love people who are unavailable for you and keep choosing to love those who you are most likely to be connecting to the trauma bond nature versus the fact that this is an actual healthy chemistry and healthy connection. Um, I've talked in other episodes and if you are not new to this self help world, you know that a trauma bond is, um, a really intense connection that's based on just recreating your trauma with this person. So out of a room of a hundred people, you've heard me say this before in a room of a hundred people, you will find the one person who's going to recreate the same sense of abandonment, rejection, pain, um, disappointment that you've had in earlier relationships, typically parental caregiver relationships. Um, and it doesn't matter if he's in a, in a suit and overalls makes six figures, makes eight figures, makes four figures. Um, somehow, no matter what you try, no matter how you try to mix it up, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, you find the dude who's going to do it, or you find the woman who's going to do it to you. Right. Um, another symptom. So that's just one symptom <laughs> to look out for. Another symptom is only seeing what you want to see and ignoring all of the warning signs because you have fallen in love very quickly because you have fallen in love with the fantasy of this. You as the hopeless romantic have played out this whole movie, whether or not you're someone who says you like the movies or not, you have your own movie in your mind about how you will, um, um, conquer the, the, the incidents and conquer the, the hurdles that y'all have right now, whether the hurdle is they're dating somebody else or whether their hurdle is they live on the other side of the world or whether the hurdle is, is that they're emotionally unavailable or there's a whole lot of chaos going on. You will focus on the bits that you think are redeemable and ignore the rest because love will conquer all as a hopeless romantic. Um, number, number three is you're not able to let go once you've bonded, which goes back to falling hard um, loving hard, um, and actually leaning into that. So, um, in my experience, the people who talk about, um, when I love, I love hard, there's, there's no shame in that. So, and because you see this as a strength, you will actually overcommit to someone to prove how much you love them in hopes that they will see that love and be like, Oh, you know what, girl, you know what? I see, I see how much you are here for me. I've been doing all kinds of crazy. Let me turn around and, um, and make this right for you. Like that's part of the fantasy that does not happen again, because you have chosen someone who is unhealthy. Um, so there's that, um, related to that, actually not related to that, but the fourth symptom is initial attraction for you is more important than anything else. So one of the things that I really have to work through with my students, um, our coaching program is called the recovery school because we get into all this and we unlearn all of this things that we logically know, you know, a lot of these things are things that may be like, Oh dang, that's me. How she knows she reading me for filth. Like these are the DMs that, that y'all send me. Um, and so, but some of these things may be things we logically know, but putting it into practice and actually catching ourselves is a lot harder. 
Um, if you, if it was as simple as knowing that she would have done it by now. Right. Um, but this initial attraction piece is more important than anything else. Y'all, you have to get used to being in a relationship with a healthy person. So here's, here's the antithesis of, um, of love addiction, which is love avoidance. I, and this is when you constantly put up walls with people. It's hard for them to get to know you. You might start off strong in a relationship, but it fizzles out because they get on your nerves or you start picking them apart or you find something that, um, is not going to work. And you magnify that until there's a, a reason for you to leave. And so people ask me often, can I be both? I do, I do my love addict stuff. And I also, um, consistently push people away. And the answer is yes, because you switch your position based on who's around you. So if the person you're talking to is unavailable, you love that. Like, wait till we get to the codependent, which is next. Like you, you love a case, you love a project. Um, but when someone is healthy and wants to call you and spend time with you and follow up and hang out, and this is not just romantic partnerships. These are friendships too. Like, it's like, it's overwhelming. Like it feels like a little bit too much. So the way that this is connected to initial attraction is sometimes, not all the times, but sometimes the way that this shows up is if someone is healthy and available, you might not really think that they're cute. And some of you have had this experience, a really healthy, available person has wanted to spend time with you. And you're like, I'm not really attracted to them. And you're telling your friend about them. They're like, let me see a picture. And you show them a picture and they're like, girl, what is, what is wrong with you? <laughs> they're cute. And you're like, yeah, I guess. But like, there's like some kind of invisible wall in film that stops you from being able to connect to this person. So that's what this is. This is the stuff we got to unlearn the, the unconscious bias that we have to work through. And the fifth thing for the hopeless romantic is some of your relationships in some of your relationships, you were the only one who was in love. You liked them more than they liked you. You were a little bit more committed and this is for the hopeless romantic. Okay. Now let's talk about our codependents. Um, so, so for my codependent ladies, um, my codependent love addicts, um, so here's the thing before I get into this, every single person who's a love addict is codependent just by nature of the word, but not every person who is codependent is a love addict. Okay. So codependence is when you struggle with maintaining your own sense of, um, boundaries and self-worth when you are in relationship with somebody else, they become your emotions and how you feel about yourself is very dependent on whether or not that person is being responsive to you, whether or not they are healthy and happy. Um, if they are sad, you're sad. If they're struggling, you feel like you're struggling, um, for a multitude of reasons. You can be codependent with, um, your, with your, um, romantic partners, obviously with your family, with your siblings, with, um, people at work, with your bosses, with, uh, I, I remember that one of the things I used to have to work on. And when I was working in the school system, there was a point in time that I was working in, um, in schools as a school counselor, kind of doing more of like social work type, um, abilities. Cause it was a, it was a, um, or responsibilities, not abilities, um, because it was a charter school. So, um, I was actually able to be very hands on and like in it with the families in it with what was going on with them doing house calls sometimes, um, doing counseling in my office. And I had to really work on not being codependent with them because of how, how involved you get into that, right? Not taking on the responsibility of how they feel. So you as a love addict, if you are using relationships to self-medicate and self-soothe and to fix something on the inside, right? So if this relationship works out, then that means that I'm okay. That means that I'm not broken. That means that love exists for me kind of thing. By nature, that is codependence. So the way that someone who operates more as a codependent love addict um, you may compulsively over-focus on fixing a relationship or a person 
or becoming needless and wantless if that's what they want um, in order to have them take care of you or to feel needed and secure. So some symptoms of our codependent lady for our codependent ladies is that you may have neglected family or friends because of your relationship. So because um, that relationship needed attention, because it needed fixing, um, of course, those of us who are in partnerships with narcissists um, who are very demanding and possessive and controlling, um, so adhering to um, take care of them. Um, but this doesn't have to be a narcissistic relationship. This can just be because you think that this person is the one and you just forget everybody else. You kind of forget your hobbies and you go cocoon um, <laughs> and you focus all of your time on them. So let me pause and say this. A lot of the things that I'm sharing, um, just like I said with hopeless romantic when I started that definition, are normal developmental parts of a relationship. Um, it is totally normal for when you meet someone and you know, you're falling for them for y'all to have this honeymoon period where you just want to spend all your time together and you're just caking and all of that stuff. But when this is your two things, when this is your pattern in all of your relationships, um, first of all, second of all, when it's past the normal honeymoon period and also when it's immediate. So as soon as you get uh, a partner, um, of whatever gender, as soon as you get a partner, you're immediately your, your ghost. Um, there's no gradual staggering of, okay, I'm building trust with this person. So they start to get a little bit more and more of my time. No, you just disappear. And, um, your friends and your family know that means that you have a new man or a new woman. And that's why, um, you're gone. It's just, no, you know, this, they know this. Um, also, like I was about to say, it lasts past the normal honeymoon period. Like you are gone for months and years at a time before you reappear if or when the relationship is not going well or you've broken up. A second symptom of a codependent love addict is you try really hard to be who your partner wants, um, wants you to be. So this goes into becoming needless and wantless. So if they like something, this is more than just you are taking an interest in them. You kind of forget your likes and your dislikes and you just kind of merge into what they want to be so that you can be this nice, happy couple that does everything together or so that you can be available in case they want you to be a part of whatever their hobby or their event or their pastime is. And what's really interesting about this is most of the time, Sometimes, you know, in efforts to be available for them, if you have someone who's really unavailable, you could have given up a big part of your life and a good part of your freedom to be available for them, but they actually aren't taking you and involving you in these things. So you're kind of just sitting around waiting for y'all to do something, waiting for y'all to connect. Um, you're filling your life with, with work. You're filling your life with you know, cleaning your house and doing all of these individual tasks, but because you've cut out social connections and other things that are actual commitments to be available for them, you really are, your life is kind of put on hold waiting for them. The other, um, alternative is this person is, um, um, they receive you letting go of your life and your pastimes and all of that, um, to do everything together. And, um, not be your own individual person. Again, typically when I'm talking about these love addicted patterns, I'm not talking about healthy partnerships, um, because there are some partnerships where, you know, people just can't get enough of each other. They are best friends in all things. They're partners in all things. And yes, they have their own individual stuff, but they are going to be together as much as possible. Both of their love languages are quality time. They speak the same language. They do all the things, um, but they are their number ones. And that does happen. But I am talking mostly when I teach these lessons and the women who usually respond to this is you are over giving in these relationships, which is the next one. So number three is you take more responsibility um, more than your share of the responsibility for the survival of the rela relationship than that person. So you're the one who's constantly 
um, looking to talk about things, to fix things, to plan dates, to plan experiences, to look for a couples counselor who talks more in couples counseling, um, who tries to initiate the repairs, who tries to keep the household going, whatever it might be, you are the one who takes responsibility for it. And then on top of that, anytime you try to self-correct and say, wow, this feels heavy, um, you are very easily either shamed by the other person, especially if that person is unhealthy and a narcissist, or you might even shame yourself for even going to the place of thinking, wow, this is too much, or wow, I need some help here, or wow, I'm doing everything. You'll go back to, well, let me look at my part. Let me try my best to fix this. You know, it's not fair that I'm saying that they're not doing their part because the other day I had an attitude and because I had an attitude, this is equal. And we'll, we'll look at the fact that we're responding to the fact that we're being neglected, which is a normal, healthy response for you to be agitated, to be irritated, to feel demanding, to, to say with, um, assertiveness what you deserve but we will look at that as, as us being mean, as us being too much instead of acting in our power with that. So that is um, number three. And number four is related to that. You have a high tolerance for suffering, i.e. being neglected, feeling depressed, feeling lonely in relationships in order to avoid the pain of separating and being alone, right? So let me just, because it's been a minute since we started this podcast. It's been about 25 minutes at this point. If you're feeling me with any of the things that I've talked about so far with the hopeless romantic and the codependent, you need to join us at our free workshop coming up this Monday. Um, and again, that link is blackgirlsheal.org slash webinar. Um, and you can join us there. Okay. Um, or just click, click the link in the bio if you can't remember that. <laughs> Not the link in the bio. Click the link in the show notes. You can tell I'm on Instagram all the time, y'all. All right. So there's that one. Number three, the third type of love addict is our serial monogamous. Ooh, now this is probably my favorite one to talk about because there's a whole lot of serial monogamers out there not knowing that you're a serial monogamers and you need to identify yourself. You need to put that badge on your chest and just know that this is your type. It don't have to be your type. You weren't born a serial monogamous, but you need to know what your problem is so that you can fix it. Yes? Yes. So a serial monogamous is one of the four different types of love addicts um, where women may compulsively go from relationship to relationship due to finding it difficult to be alone and in relationship with themselves. Your relationship with yourself is actually your first relationship. Um, and it is the your relationship with your parents that teach you whether or not you like you and whether or not you are a good enough person um and so whenever you are alone and single the person that you're left with is you and if you don't like you you're gonna find all these different ways to create um distraction so let's go ahead and let me jump into the symptoms off the bat so one of the signs of being a serial monogamous is you have not had any time or a long period of time being single. This includes situationships or friends that you spend time with. So we know the classic serial monogamer is the one who can have um, many one to two year to four year to five year to eight year relationships back to back, maybe just a couple of months in between um, each relationship. Most of the time, there's someone who's kind of waiting in the background. So there's like an, a smooth transition into the next relationship, right? But many of us secret serial monogamous don't know that we are that because we do not count the fact that we still are using men and women as validation in the background, even though we don't have a title. So again, the situationships. So we're hanging out, we're doing boyfriend, girlfriend thing, girlfriend, girlfriend thing, um, person, person thing without the label and, um, you know, hanging out, having sex, um, them paying for dates, you paying for things, getting gifts, um, them texting you good morning. 
uh, y'all hanging out and doing things alone or with other people. So we're doing all these things with title, without the title, and you're still not knowing what it's like to be in partnership just for you, just by you knowing how to affirm yourself and spend time with yourself. So that's when you overtly have someone you're spending time with, a situationship type thing, or someone that you call your quote unquote friend. You can still be a serial monogamer if you are not in a full relationship, if you're not in a situationship, but you have quote unquote friends. You have people who you know like you, who are constantly flirting with you, trying to um, get at you, and you are lightly entertaining the attention, even if you never go there with them. Um, of course, this is not to penalize those of us who um, just are the women who constantly have attention, who are just fine out here in these, in these streets. But it's the entertaining of it that we do on the inside of how good it feels to be desired. We don't know what it's like to live our life and to esteem ourselves without the external praise, without um, the outside affirmation. This is a very, very dangerous place to be because if and when all of that stuff fades, we may feel lost, we may feel lonely, we may feel dejected, uh, we may feel like um, we're broken or we're flawed. So if you're trying to understand if you pass the vibe check for being a serial monogamist, or I guess trying to rule out being a serial monogamist, I want you to think, even if you've been single technically for years, um, haven't been dating anybody, what is the longest amount of time you have gone without anyone um, entertaining anyone who you were flirting with, that was flirting with you, that y'all were just quote unquote friends, but it was just purely you and only you and no, no affirmation from anyone that you found sexually attractive or that found you sexually attractive? What's the longest you've gone in that period. And while you were in that period, while we're here, um, even though this is not a quality of serial monogamous, but just for everyone in general who can relate to that during that period of time, if you have had these periods of singleness, how did you feel? Were you able to be connected to you and affirming you and in relationship with you? Or did you fill your time with a whole lot of distractions, even distractions that are good on paper? Anything that took extended amounts of time from you being able to sit in silence just with you, or if there's a part of you that fears what that's like to just be with yourself with the Netflix off, with um, TikTok down, with no books in front of you to read, but just you with your own thoughts, with your own mind, how does that feel for you? Um, that's something to look at. Is that something that's a little bit anxiety producing? Is there a part of you that would be like, I don't even know what I would do with myself. And if I'm not doing something, what would I do? This is where our work begins. Okay. So that was just a small tangent. So I've seen serial monogamy work in two different ways for women. Sometimes you can be someone who's a serial monogamous who just, you are one of the lucky ones who does find really sweet, compassionate, healthy partners. It's really more about the fact that you do not know how to be with yourself, but you're finding partners who um, just take really great care of you, who try, who are open. And so when y'all break up, it's just because the relationship has run its course, you've grown apart, that kind of thing. The way that I see this one play out in the end is... Um, when the relationship one runs out or say you're someone who has children, um, you do not know who Sheena is. You do not know who you are. So the ability to be able to find happiness within yourself is very hard, um, which can lead to you feeling really sad um, and feeling really out of place and feeling really lost. So that saying that goes, wherever you go, there you are, you know, you bring yourself, you bring your insecurities, you bring your fears, even the ones that you've repressed and pushed down everywhere you go, even in a healthy partnership. And so these things can and do resurface if you do not deal with them. 
The other direction that serial monogamous that I see, which is um, usually the women that I work with, um, because you're in the middle of a problem, is you're in some serial monogamous um, relationships with people who are unavailable. So you will spend months and years of your life with people that you're trying to fix and make it work and bring things back to how they used to be or cycle them out and start dating someone else. Um, but you're just never really alone and you keep going from relationship to relationship, from problem to problem and not really being able to take a breath to figure out why. And even during the times that you're single, you still have these people on the side who are gassing you up and trying to connect with you that's prefer that's producing that external affirmation as well. So you're not able to have the chance to stop and look at you. Okay, you being the common denominator. And our last and final type is the fantasizer. So this one, the fantasizer love addict is a woman who may create and fall in love with the fantasy of who they want someone to be or create and live in a full fantasy world as a form of self-medication and protection from outside disappointment. It's easier to go inside of your head and get lost in your daydreams um, and relationships, daydreams about relationships that may be real or completely in your head. That's the first one. So I'll repeat it again. You might get as a fantasizer, you might find yourself as someone who constantly gets lost in her daydreams about relationships that could be real people in your life or people who are completely made up in your head. So um, I think, I don't know if I've shared this with my students before, but one of the first ways that I know that fantasy affected my life is I know that when I was um, probably around middle school, I heavily used fantasy to self-soothe. I felt lonely in a lot of ways. I felt really out of place. So I would have these different um, stories that I would tell myself to help me get to sleep at night. And they would just be basically extended romantic comedies of the adult version of me falling in love with the dream person or having this really romantic um, overture or experience, like literally movies, y'all. <laughs> I remember I used to play in my head as a, as a preteen. And this doesn't stop. I've worked with so many women that still use fantasy to self-medicate and to feel safe, um, to create a world that is their own because the real world um, does not feel like it is safe to dream um, because the real world has some disappointment anytime that they have tried to step out or most of the time what the actual cause is, no matter what the, the outcome is, feeling like they are not worthy of what they truly desire and want. That even if they were to try to step out and get that thing, that they would end up being disappointed. And often that thing, especially in the context that I teach, you know, here in Black Girls Heal with relationships um, and healing from trauma being my expertise, um, the fear is that they will never truly um, find a partner that will love them and see them as beautiful, um, adore them and be faithful and be their best friend and have fun with like that whole package is just, is unattainable, right? To find someone who truly loves them just for being them. So it's easier to go into their mind. Um, so I put this here because I think this is a secret way that, um, many of us self-medicate, um, that we don't really put words to. And I want you to know that your fantasies are built from natural God-given desires that you have. So the goal is not to eliminate dreaming, is to make your dream your actual real life versus you having to escape into this world that doesn't exist. Um, and then feeling lonely and lost and out of place when you're living in your true everyday life. So hopefully that makes sense. I already shared the second symptom of this, which is you feel safer creating your fantasy world versus going for what you want. The third symptom or sign of being a fantasizer love addict is you see what you want to see in relationships, ignoring red flags. So, um, that's self-explanatory. We've already talked about this before going off the potential and what it could be this little part of what you've seen before that you think is redeeming. And so you self-medicate. And the reason that you're able to stay in this relationship is because you spend so much time ruminating 
on how it's going to be and how good it's going to be when this, once this little bitty thing is tweaked, once this little bitty thing is fixed. Sometimes your fantasy is, especially those of us who have codependent backgrounds or tendencies, your fantasy is about how with your love and with your support, how he or she is going to come around and triumph. How with your love and support, they're going to get a better job. With your love and support, they're going to start talking about their feelings. They're going to reconnect with their father. They're going to be a better parent. Whatever your outcome is, this is what you replay over and over instead of the facts and the reality of what's going on. And then the fourth one I also already said for fantasize or love addicts is sometimes you struggle with asking for what you want for fear of being rejected or not getting it. Um, those of us who struggle with fantasy, um, again, the common denominator is a deep sense of shame and um, low self-worth, which is why when I talk about um, healing from love addiction and love avoidance, I also talk about feeling not enough. Um, you will very rarely, um, I do sometimes lately just because it's a lot to say when I introduce what I do, but often I will talk about this, this nagging, aching feeling that's underneath um, and that is the thing that we're trying to self-medicate with being in partnerships, being in relationships, trying to get our happily ever after without knowing and without believing, because maybe you haven't been there, that you can get all the things. You can get the house, you can have all the money, you can get the career, you can have the man, you can have the baby, but wherever you go, there you are. If you are unhappy now, you are going to be unhappy then. And I used to hate when people would say that because I'm like, well, chick, I'm doing all the things to make myself happy. So it felt like people were blaming me for my unhappiness. Like I'm the one who's faulty and I'm not doing enough. And that's, that's not what I mean. What I'm trying to communicate is I see the work that you're doing with yourself. You're listening to this 45 minute podcast episode about love addiction all the way to the end, right? To try to figure out, okay, what is my next step? I see that. You are truly investing yourself in investing in yourself and your time and your energy, maybe even your finances, maybe the mechanisms that you're using to get there are not the right ones. Not that it's not possible for you to get there. Not that it is not possible to tap into that true contentment and joy, but maybe there's just a missing piece. You know, I talk in a previous podcast episode about um, using therapy versus coaching, and there's like a whole long metaphor I'm not going to get into with that, um, but definitely check out that episode. I know that's um, one that people have really learned a lot from using that metaphor, but um, maybe it's just that you've been using a screwdriver for so long that you just need to add to the tool belt. There's, there's nothing wrong with the screwdriver, screwdriver being therapy. Um, but maybe you do need to add coaching. Maybe you need to add something else that's more directive and intensive to help get you over that hump, right? Um, which is definitely where Black Girls Heal and the work that we do here come into play at. So all of that said, girl, I hope that these four types have been illuminating for you. I hope that you've been able to identify where you are if it applies, if you have grown a whole lot, especially my ladies who are listening who are alumni of my um, programs. I hope that you're able to listen to this and be like, oh yeah, that used to be me and it ain't me no more. <laughs> and just celebrate yourself. Um, and then also maybe see um, places that might be good to revisit, you know, because part of healing is looking at the different layers, because maybe you, you healed from one part of it, but listening to it now, you're like, oh, okay, before I was focused on these symptoms. Now this is the next one that would be good for me to look at. Um, or this is a good place for me to just recalibrate and recenter so I can focus on myself. And, and that's for everyone. So, so yeah, that's today's podcast episode. I would love, love, love to see y'all at our free workshop or at our conference coming up. Registration is still open. I'm sending you all love, joy, prosperity, and goodness. And I can't wait to see you next week. Y'all take care of yourselves. 
Hey, so thanks for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoy what you learned today, it doesn't have to stop here. Check out the Black Girls Heal website at blackgirlsheal.org for more resources to help you heal from intimacy disorders like love addiction and love avoidance. The best time to start or restart your healing journey is now. You can grab a free copy of our five-step roadmap to heal love addiction, love avoidance, and love deprivation by going to blackgirlsheal.org slash roadmap. And if you're on social media, feel free to follow us at Black Girls Heal on Instagram and Facebook.